Canada, where are you going live? Yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah. I know Becky is going to give us a final. Okay. A final go. Yeah. Did, did the did Capri end late? Because I saw I saw we had about fifty people, and I figured oh we had the the move over, and then I noticed like minutes later we an extra like hundred came in, and I was mm -hmm. like oh wow yeah we missed yeah <laughs> she ended about six minutes late. Oh, okay. Well, people missed our Garcetti video. I'm telling you, we have to cut that thing up and use it again. It was a great, great video. Very true. And we are live on YouTube, but I believe that we are still waiting for the next session to, to end. So I'll give you a ping. Okay. Welcome to those that are just joining us. Uh, we're gonna give it another minute or two here for folks to come over from our power panel. So just bear with us for, for a few moments. Welcome to those that are just joining us. Uh, we're just gonna give it a few more moments for folks to come over from our power panel, uh, which is gonna end in just a moment or two. I feel like my neighborhood is only the loudest when I have important things going on. So, <laughs> I don't know if you can hear the, the kids and the gardeners and the trash trucks in the background, but it's only on important days. Other days, it's very quiet. <laughs> Pleasant sound. Joy. That's true. It's the sounds of life. It could be way worse. It could be way worse. I've got some good birds in the background too. <laughs> I thank you to those who are joining us. We're just waiting another moment or two for our power panel to end. Um, so just bear with us and we'll get right into our civic awards. All right, thank you to those who have joined us. We're just moments away from starting here. Uh, I hear our power panel is, is closing out and they're sending people over here in just a moment.
All right, I'm I'm sensing the critical mass of people people joining now coming from our, our power panel. Um, I hope everyone's doing well, and thank you for joining us on this Friday afternoon for our 20th annual Municipal Green Building Conference and Expo. I know it, that's amazing. It's amazing us as well. Uh, really pleased for the awards we had today. We're excited with the new format we're going to use to show you our buildings that have won awards over the past year, uh, and also excited for our speakers. So to introduce our speaker today, uh, I'd like to introduce Darren Hanway, who's the manager of energy programs and strategy at Southern California Gas Company. Darren? Thank you, Ben, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you're enjoying this wonderful conference so far. A lot of uh, great stuff yet to come. So it's at SoCal Gas, um, we're the nation's largest gas distribution utility. Our mission is to be the cleanest, safest, and most innovative energy company in America. And we are dedicated to leading the transition to a decarbonized energy system. In fact, we are proud, very proud to have just recently announced our Aspire 2045 vision, which is a sustainability strategy that includes a bold commitment to achieve zero greenhouse gas emissions in our operations and the delivery of energy by 2045. We'll get there by investing in our infrastructure, continuing our leadership in renewable gas technologies and green hydrogen, and always supporting advancements in energy efficiency. For the next keynote address, I would like to introduce Mahesh Ramanujam, the president and CEO of the United States Green Building Council. Mahesh couples an extensive background in technology and innovation with his goal of unifying building standards and building healthier, more prosperous communities. As a leader of more than 13 million green builders, Mahesh conceived the Living Standard Campaign, the organization's grassroots, grassroots initiative that supports the ambitious, inclusive, and resilient vision for the decades ahead. Healthy people in healthy places equals a healthy economy. Mahesh's storied career is rooted in his passion for that vision and his efforts to evolve society beyond the passing awareness of green building to a universal adoption of its high-minded practices and his sincere desire that a healthier building becomes not only an urgent civic responsibility, but a guarantee of a better quality of life for generations to come. We should all be, strive to be champions for that vision and thank you for your leadership in this area. Uh, and now it is my pleasure to welcome Mahesh to our virtual stage. Uh, thank you, Darren. Uh, thank you, Ben, for inviting me to discuss the agency of the climate crisis. While the pandemic has truly been heartbreaking to witness, I myself have lost friends and family in India. We know that in the coming years, climate change is only going to compound public health crises at a greater rate and impact billions of lives. If the past year has taught us anything, it's that we need to act with speed and that whatever our solutions are, they must be intersectional. The sustainability landscape has changed a lot over the last 25 years and the geopolitical, climate and economic issues the world currently faces are only expediting that evolution. So we can no longer afford to view our work as a single issue topic. We need immediate and scalable solutions to tackle the single largest existential threat of our life. Over the last two years, it's been reported that more than 16 million people globally, including an estimated 1.2 million Americans, they're displaced because of climate events. And that number is only expected to grow. And in a new large sample global survey on climate economics from the Institute for Policy Integrity at NYU School of Law, nearly nine out of 10 respondents agreed that climate change would worsen global inequality. And they were nearly unanimous in believing that the benefits of net zero emissions by 2050 would vastly outweigh the costs. It was also reported recently that as economies are starting to bounce back, GAG emissions are already creeping up higher than before the pandemic. And despite that uptick, only 2.5% of the world's recovery spending went toward green initiatives, with a mass majority of that driven by only five countries. Now, it's been extremely heartening to see some of the policies and commitments from the Biden administration, especially the American jobs plan. But we need globally coordinated leadership if you're going to meet the Paris Agreement's target and eliminate GFG emissions by 2050. We also need a coordinated effort between the private and public sector, as well as continued investment and advancement 
in technology to meet the money. The good news is you have already seen many private corporations, state and city governments make pledges to reduce emissions. Some on a path towards net zero by 2050. But what we really need is to map out policies and investments to back up these pledges and get results. We need global coordination in sharing data and developing definitions and standards which can help accelerate and scale solutions. For more than 25 years, the US Green Building Council and our partners like USGPCLA have been dedicated to building awareness of the impact buildings have on the environment and human health. With the development of LEED and the incredible support of people like you, we have established an entire community of sustainability leaders around a common cause. Better buildings equal better lives. At the beginning of 2020, UGPC announced four new pillars for the organization designed to serve as a foundation for the work we will do over UGPC's second generation. The next 25 years will be guided by the intersectionality of sustainability, health and wellness, resilience, and equity. And because each of our four pillars has historically already been a large part of UGPC's past work, there will be a natural transition to an even more successful second generation. Under the pillar of sustainability, we have a strong strategy with LEED. With our latest version of the rating system, LEED version 4.1, we have raised our energy reference standard and added a carbon metric for both new and existing buildings, providing a tool to directly measure the impact buildings are having on the planet. We have also made improvements to the renewable energy credit, so buildings are incentivized to invest in a kind of clean energy technology that lowers emissions even further. And in LEED version 4.1, we are asking project teams to understand the embodied carbon in that material search. Adding carbon as a metric to everything we do sets the foundation upon which all new and existing buildings and eventually communities and cities can assess their current footprint and begin mitigation. But our success in decarbonization will require more than good intentions. It must result in real world outcomes and measurable performance. Art is our tool to measure the real world performance of spaces, buildings, and places around the world. As part of our commitment to decarbonization, we have recently released the ARC Climate Risk Module. This new tool is broadly aligned with the recommendations from the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD, and it enables project teams to assess transition risk with the ARC Carbon Score, a component of LEED version 4.1, and the ARC electrification score. Additionally, it assesses physical risk with a detailed climate impact assessment, a risk footprint report from our partner, Coastal Resource Consultant. Together, these give our users a comprehensive view of their progress toward decarbonization and their preparation for future conditions. But as we improve on the front and look toward a decarbonized future, for LEED to remain relevant and responsive to the changing market and for it to continue as the world's most widely used green building program, we need to continue investments in LEED and push it even further. By that, that be listening to our members, the project team support, adopting LEED, and our other key stakeholders, our updates and improvements to LEED must be a reflection of feedback from our most valued partners. Recently, one of the ways that we have done this is by pushing LEED buildings to go beyond by reaching net zero milestones. If we are going to tackle climate change, we only have one choice, to set our sights at zero. With more than 30 certifications already achieved, our LEED Zero program is a complementary lead that verifies the achievement of net zero goals in carbon, energy, water, and waste. Last week, I celebrated the LEED Zero certification of a model home in the Hunters Point community in Florida. The project was the first home to earn lead zero energy. Developer Marshall Gobati says that community is fully on board with net zero homes and 60 out of 80 homes at the community have already sold. One of my favorite stories is the Discovery Center Elementary School in Arlington, Virginia. Discovery was the first school to achieve lead zero energy and its zero energy design resulted in $117,000 of annual savings, enough to fund two teachers' salaries. Plus, the school serves as a learning lab for students to get an early start on sustainability education, creating a culture of stewardship and accountability as well. But if you are going to move the needle, 
need acts of exchange on every possible scale. That means not only addressing projects like these, but also the cities and communities that they belong to. That's why we created lead for cities and communities for change on an even grander scale. Designed to support continuous plans for reducing energy, water, waste, and transportation, lead for cities and communities bolsters health, equity, education, and resilience. And with more than 270 cities and communities around the world registered or certified, we are improving the overall quality of life for more than 130 million people. All of these efforts are part of our vision to ensure the next phase of UGDC's efforts will be regenerated. As a long-term plan for addressing health, water scarcity, air quality, resilience, and climate change, obstacles that threaten our survival, we have introduced a vision for lead possible. That lead building generate more energy than they use and remove more carbon than they produce. The goal I've set for UGDC is to require all the new construction projects to achieve lead possible starting in 2025 and all existing buildings to be lead possible by 2050. Lead positive is our long-term vision for how lead will become regenerative and restorative. Addressing the issues, the goal faces requires us to take that next step that zero and build a regenerative world. This vision is designed to help push the market beyond just reducing the negative impact buildings have towards a future, but buildings give back more than they take, where they generate more energy than they consume, save more water than they use, remove more carbon than they produce, and have a positive impact on the physical, mental, and social health of their occupants. Under resiliency, lead and rely are our chief tools to address resiliency by promoting and advocating for principles of design, construction, operation, and maintenance that address resilience goals. Rely is a rating system that takes a holistic approach to resilient design. It can be used to plan for acute hazards, that buildings, and community space during unplanned events, prepare to mitigate these hazards, and design and construct buildings to maintain critical life saving services during catastrophic events. It is my hope that down the line, all these projects will also be required to certify to rely. EOGBC also released a brief this year that outlines an expanded suite of programs and resources focused on improving building and community resilience in the face of climate risk. Now, Resilience is a term often mentioned in the same breath as climate change. But a term we need to hear more in our lexicon and act on at a much swifter pace is equity. That's why we have made it one of our foundational pillars. While UGBC has done a lot of work here, it's certainly not enough. We recognize we are not yet a leader, but we can be. Any approach we take in combating climate change must also be equitable as it is the most vulnerable among us who will suffer the most. And in order to achieve our mission and vision, we need to address some challenging questions and take bolder action as an organization. Equity has different meanings and markets in different regions of the world. It requires deeply personal, often uncomfortable discussions about painful experiences. And it requires conversations where you are see just more listening than talking, and that we amplify voices that have gone unheard. Since so many of our community members and stakeholders are already living in their communities, we have taken a first follower approach. We strive to take their great vision and implement it because we are a platform to do so. To kickstart this effort, we started by hosting a series of equity summits last year, where we listened to leaders both inside and outside our community. Hundreds of members, lead professionals, community development experts, and other sustainability and social and environmental justice leaders shared their experiences. They showed us how their work prioritizes equity, and we learned strategies for bringing new stakeholders into the process of developing green buildings, cities, and communities, and empowering these partners to become involved in and influence the planning process and benefit from these project outcomes is an important step. One participant said something I think really hit home. They said, those of us born in low status communities that talented ones are taught to measure success by how we get away from our communities. I know that sentiment. I lived that sentiment growing up in China. And there is a better way we can measure and make meaningful change in the places we call home. 
We want you, GPC, to empower community members impacted by inequities to be involved and lead the process of coming up with the solutions to address those inequities. We also want us to play a proactive role by serving as a hub to provide tools, resources, and expertise to those community members. And they want us to act now. So after listening and learning from our community, we announced that Green Bull Virtual, the launch of our USGBC All-In Equity Program, and released a brief that outlines work with our stakeholders to address the social, health, and economic disparities within their communities. This includes a commitment to transforming our own internal governance, including our boards, committees, and the policies by which they operate. We want to ensure we are including and empowering those who are not historically being able to participate in sharing our vision. Evolving equity strategies and lead to prioritize equity in credit inputs and requirements, and creating new pilot credits to fill gaps. We must expand scholarships, grants, and funding to support members of underserved communities. For example, we have begun providing funding for 500 people from underserved communities to learn a lead professional credential, and 100 professionals to learn either our Sustainability Excellence Associate or Sustainability Excellence Professional Credential. I'm happy to share that we have already awarded more than 200 of these scholarships. USGBC has long advocated for a sustainable and equitable world. But sustainability is simply not a reality without equity. We know that we can do more, and our all in program is our strategy to build this uncompromising future. Finally, health and wellness has been deeply entrenched within the lead rating system since its origins. 70% of the credits in LEED directly or indirectly impact human health and wellness. And we expanded on this pillar in May of 2020 by releasing our reimagined vision of UHGBC. Healthy people in healthy places equals a healthy economy. We have said over and over that the health of people, planet, and profit are inextricably linked. And with the pandemic, people all over the world have experienced what that means. Our reimagined vision is primarily designed to both reinforce that human health and wellness have always been foundational tenets of need and to simplify our messaging to appeal to a wider audience. During UGBC's first 25 years, we have done an excellent job of getting the global real estate and construction industries to implement lead. But for us to realize our vision, we need to make lead mainstream. This means addressing the historical issues we are facing in the market. The misconceptions that lead is only about planetary health and energy efficiency. To help people make the connection between green buildings and the positive, tangible benefits they can have on their lives and on their communities. And in doing so, scale up demand for lead beyond just our current audience, which will lead to a, a greater market transformation. Our new vision and the corresponding economic regulatory strategy specifically outlines offerings for how we, as an organization, will hold ourselves accountable during and beyond the time. This includes new tools in lead, like the safety first credits, which have already been implemented by more than 400 projects around the world, with more than 50 credits already awarded. These nine credits are designed to assist companies with building the entry and future plan and planning by supporting workplace reoccupancy and social distancing, cleaning and disinfecting, air quality and infection monitoring, building system water recommissioning, and much more. The safety first credits built upon lead sustainable best practices and will help rebuild trust in spaces, assist with the global recovery effort, and secure a healthier future for life. As we begin to turn the corner on the pandemic, I recently took some time to reflect on the past year, and I had a very profound moment where I thought, you know what? We were prepared for this. We have known that the intersection of health risks and the climate change is an escalating global crisis. We have known that building emissions account for 40% of CO2 emissions globally. And we have known that the ability to connect the dots between healthier living and a healthier building will be one of the biggest factors in the length and quality of a person's life. So when I say we were prepared for this, I mean it in a very literal sense. Every member of this community has spent our entire careers preparing for the most dangerous realities of the future. And whether we realize it or not, preparing for the worst case scenario has actually ensured we are building for the best possible hope. That kind of proactivity has always been 
at the heart of your GDC and this community. And while this new normal is a different type of new, it's not the first time we have had to reimagine our systems around cultural flashpoints. After the 2008 financial collapse, LEAP stood strong, thanks in part to LEAP 2009. Each time we face a crisis, we have successfully turned to strategy and standards to raise the bar. At this time, it is not going to just be about being into ourselves within an already agreed upon ecosystem. This time, we are facing the compounding health crisis of climate change and COVID-19. We are seeing geopolitical upheaval and a never before seen void in global leadership. This time, our plan has to be more savvy. It has to be more self-aware. It has to be a lot less about declarations and a lot more about detailed plans of action for returning to a more complicated post-pandemic world, which means the strategy is simple. If you are not winning by the rules of the game, it is time to rewrite the playbook. That's why we're already looking at what's on the horizon in 2021, 2022, and beyond. Over the next year, we are going to transform this world to move from a passing awareness of UNGDC's commitment to raising the standard of living to an accelerated universal adoption of our vision for healthy people in healthy places equals a healthy With so much at stake, we have to rebuild fast and accelerate on our friends, on our new and existing buildings, on our cities and communities, on net zero and regenerative design. And we have to ask ourselves some challenging questions like, how are we going to respond to the global pandemic and rebuild economies around the world? How will we remain resilient against climate change and future threats to our global health? How will we engender trust in one another and our certification for spaces where we live, learn, work, and play? In other words, what is our plan for creating a higher living standard for current and future generations? We can no longer afford to be cautious and to operate in silos thinking each of us can tackle this alone. We have to move now. We have an existing generation of climate refugees already displaced from their homes, offices, and communities, which means that rewriting our playbook has to happen in real time. By writing a new playbook, we can move from awareness to acceleration to adoption to a post-pandemic world that more accurately reflects the diverse and dynamic global community we have all been longing for and working towards. It'll be a world that UGBC remains a pioneer in implementing real-time solutions and adaptation methods, where we build for the worst-case scenario, but are rewarded with the best possible outcome, a universal standard of living. But to create that world, we need all of you. As I close today, I would like to invite each of you to learn more about your role in this by joining our first ever UGBC Live which is being held virtually from June 8 to 10. A new event offered to UGBC members, partners, and stakeholders. UGBC Live will produce engaging conversations about the future of buildings, communities, and cities, and well into topics that are pushing the envelope for the industry. I hope to see you all there. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mahesh, and thank you for your partnership and belief in us and our community. And we couldn't agree more that the time is now uh, and that health needs to really be a priority going forward. So, so thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and now the moment you've maybe all been waiting for is recognizing our Sustainable Design Awards and projects for public buildings here in the greater LA region. Uh, we're so pleased to be able to honor these buildings and, and these people, because it's all really all about people who are driving these projects forward, who put in the hard work over a tough year uh, to move their projects forward and achieve excellence in the work they do. Um, one of the things that we're going to be doing that's going to be different today, uh, we've actually entered all of these projects into our EcoMap LA. What is the EcoMap LA? Well, this is a tool we actually built in green, for GreenBuild in 2016 to really showcase green buildings and projects throughout the LA region. We spent a ton of time over the last six months uh, updating and reworking this platform. Uh, we're gonna showcase it to you here in just a moment, but we've added all different kinds of green buildings into this system. And we've also created the ability where you can actually upload your own projects. We wanna make this an asset for everyone in the region to showcase the work that they do. So with that, Fernanda, if you could go ahead and launch the EcoMap.
Rough. All right. Well, you can find the EcoMap on our website by going to resources on the right-hand side of the screen and going to drop down to explore EcoMap LA. And then when you go to the EcoMap page itself, you can scroll down and find some information about the, the history of the EcoMap, some basics about what it does. Uh, there's also a tutorial video below the EcoMap so you can learn how to use it. And then a form where you can post your own projects to the EcoMap so that everyone here in our region uh, can look at the great work that you're doing. And you'll see that there's a variety of categories for the buildings here uh, that are in the platform. Now we're gonna go through to the EcoMap here itself. And as you can see, we're looking here at, uh, at downtown LA. Uh, if you hit the drop down there on LA Green Buildings, you can see that we have in addition to LEED buildings, uh, we have uh, businesses certified through the LA Green Business Program. We have Envision buildings, uh, Passive House buildings, Living Building Challenge buildings, Savings by Design. So uh, if there's any other categories we need to add, we're open to it. We really meant, want this to be a showcase for our entire community showcase the work that we're doing in sustainability in the built environment. And then when you go to click on tours, we can load our tours for today. So you can see here, we have a tour for our municipal project awards here for 2021. We also have our awards that we did for our gala in 2020. And then we can do specific tours like we've done for Kilroy Realty here on the left uh, for specific portfolios of projects. And contact us if you'd like to upload more to the sheet or just use a sheet online to post them. So let's start with our award winners today. Our first winner today, and as, as Mahesh was talking about, is, is the city of Rancho Cucamonga, who's gotten a LEED Silver certification, and it's LEED for cities and communities. Uh, we're really excited about the certification. It's something that's so valuable here for the LA region. And the city is now part of a prestigious global community to be certified using LEED for cities and communities. Uh, with a population of approximately 180,000 residents and nearly 47 square miles, the city of Rancho Cucamonga is a leading city in the Inland Empire and one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in Southern California. The city implemented practical and measurable strategies and solutions aimed at improving sustainability, equity, resilience, and quality of life throughout the community. The prestigious accomplishment was made possible through a technical assisted grant through the USGBC and the Bank of America Charitable Foundation, which dedicated found funds for this project, enabling cities with the financial and educational support to improve performance over time through the pursuit of LEED for City certification. This LEED Silver certification is an integral part of the Healthy Rancho Cucamonga Initiative launched in 2008 to promote a healthy and environmentally sustainable community. This certification further guides future sustainability efforts, helps prioritize measures, and fosters collaboration with key organizations that co collectively improve the quality of life in Rancho Cucamonga. These efforts will be used to guide planning processes as the city completes the general plan update. Uh, this project team was led by Linda Ceballos, Environmental Programs Manager, Fred Lynn, Deputy Director of Engineering, Justine Garcia, Interim Deputy Director of Engineering, and Matt Burris, Deputy City Manager. Congratulations on your award and your hard work to make this happen. Our next winner here is also a, a city that was certified using the LEED for Cities uh, certification, and that's the city of Costa Mesa, which has become the first city in California and one of only four cities in the United States to have received a LEED for Cities Gold certification using the most stringent LEED version 4.1. LEED for Cities and Communities programs help local leaders create responsible, sustainable, and specific plans for natural systems, energy, water, waste, transportation, and many other factors that contribute to quality of life. The LEED framework encompasses social, economic, and environmental performance indicators and strategies with a clear data-driven means of benchmarking and communicating progress. Lead for City certification processes created the opportunity to identify gaps, opportunities for improvement, and provided the platform to work collaboratively to co-design local solutions that are realistic, timely, address equity inclusion, and reduce that disaster risk reduction while building community resilience. City staff now uses Lead for Cities and Communities framework as a way to bring together people, find win-to-win -win opportunities, leverage partnerships, identify pr private public sector collaboration, and engage the community in an inclusive way. The city also plans on taking a leadership role in Orange County to drive change and encourage other cities to do the same while inspiring social change, empowerment of communities to achieve sustainable, resilient, and inclusive economic recovery here in Southern California, which is something we all need. Congratulations to the city of Costa Mesa and uh, to the project team, which was led by Salem Afawerki, the Public Services Department, Southern California Edison, Mesa Water District, Costa Mesa Sanitary District, USGBC Orange County, and the USGBC National Lead for Cities team and Bank of America. 
Uh, next up, uh, also in Costa Mesa, we have our first municipal project winner, and that is the Costa Mesa Lions Park Project, which consists of two phases. Uh, the phase one is the Donald Duncan Library, and then the phase two is the Norma Herzog Community Center. The new Donald Duncan Library Project consisted of a demolition of the existing 20,000 square foot building uh, in, in Concrete Community Neighborhood Center. All the concrete was pulverized and buried under the new 20,000 square feet, two-story LEED Gold Certified Library. There was no concrete demolition exported from the site. Redevelopment of the Lions Park included replacing the existing neighborhood community parking lot with a new one acre grass lawn, native drought tolerant landscaping and water conserving drip irrigation system. All surface stormwater on the project site drains to large underground storage tanks that allow the stormwater to percolate down to the aquifer with no water flowing off site. As for phase two, the repurposed Norma Herzog Community Center received new energy efficient mechanical, electrical, plumbing and HVAC systems, new exterior glazing, advanced audio visual equipment, upgraded restrooms with low flush toilets and local instant heated water offices, a catering kitchen, a stage and more were also implemented as part of this project. The new community center will be able to accommodate up to 330 people in the main assembly room and 100 people in the adjacent conference room. The team for this project, uh, it's owned by the city of Costa Mesa and the public works department uh, and also led by the County of Orange Library Operations. The team included Johnson Favero Architects, Integral Group, STV Construction Incorporated, Arup Group Delta, as well as Tovey Schultz Construction Incorporated. Congratulations to you and your team. Our next project here is LAX Terminal 1.5. LAX Terminal 1.5 recently achieved LEED Silver Certification for new construction. In order to reduce the use of potable water, the building will be utilizing a new recycled water system that is being installed around the airport campus, which will work in conjunction with low flow faucets and flush valves. All rainwater runoff at the building site will be collected, filtered, and reclaimed at an offsite treatment facility. This system will ensure this rainwater will be treated and reused as opposed to being directly drained into the ocean. Several energy efficiency measures were incorporated into the building design, such as an advanced lighting control system that is programmed to decrease the use of artificial light, energy efficient air handling units to ensure occupant comfort by monitoring and regulating temperature, humidity, and air quality. The project achieved an exemplary performance credit for its use and incorporation of recycled materials throughout the building, along with the ability to recycle a large amount of waste material generated during the construction by reducing the amount of energy the building consumed and by purchasing renewable energy credits from offsite renewable energy providers. Congratulations to Los Angeles World Airports, otherwise known as LAWA, Southwest Airlines, Program Managers, AV Air Pros, IPDM, Hensel Phelps, and PGAL. Our next project is the Santa Monica College uh, Student Services Building. Santa Monica College has a strong approach to sustainable design and requires all new buildings to obtain LEED certification. The stated goal for the Student Services Center was for a LEED Gold certification, but the project team was not satisfied with that and with a strong commitment to sustainable design, managed to achieve LEED Platinum certification. Some of the sustainable design strategies included the measures, building an envelope designed to control building heat gain and loss, mechanical system selection for maximum energy efficiency and building arrangement for occupant thermal comfort, renewable energy from rooftop photovoltaic system provided to the local utility for the equivalent of 35% of the building's energy usage, and an advanced water technology with pressurized water waste system resulting in a 65% reduction of water usage. Additional measures were adopted to provide a safe and comfortable exterior, uh, such as extensive use of natural light through glazing and light wells and improved air quality through the use of low VOC materials. Some exterior sustainable project measures included retention water system for all drainage to remain on site, drought tolerant plant selection, tree and planting to reduce the heat island effect and recirculating water feature for sound mitigation from the vehicular traffic. Congratulations to the owner, Santa Monica College, and the team of Huit Zollers, Bernards, P2S Incorporated, MDBC Engineers, KPFF Consulting Engineers, RELM Studio, Empowered Solutions, LPI, Vantage Technology Consulting, and PALID Studio. Congratulations to you on this project. And now, uh, our next winner here is, uh, use, is, is the Robertson Recreation Center. The Robertson Recreation Center achieved LEED Gold certification for new construction last year. Uh, the original rec center, which was a large manor hall with a vast fireplace, first served as a community gathering space. And in the 1960s, the city removed the fireplace and installed a substandard basketball court that counted professional players such as Nick Young and Cedric Ceballos among its alumni. Uh, I think I even played there in my youth, but I was not, not as well known as those two, for sure. Uh, 
Uh, the site, an attenuated triangle bounded by busy traffic on Robertson Boulevard, presented limited opportunities for the large rectangular volume of a basketball court and the surrounding perimeter of mature Melaleuca trees further limited planning options. To engage with the rhythm of the existing landscape, the building's exterior walls weave at the drip line of the trees to form a ribbon, thereby stabilizing the structure. Designed to be as self-sufficient as possible, the building's durable interior finish is exposed concrete block to preserve coolness, while its corrugated metal exterior and perimeter of trees provide a self-shading system to minimize the need for air conditioning. Also, indirect sunlight eliminated the need for artificial lighting throughout the day in parts of the buildings. Congratulations to the City of LA, Parks and Rec, Kevin Daly Architects, Engelkirk Institutional, KPFF Consulting Engineers, Team AAD, Taylor and Gaines, and Catherine Spitz and Associates. And now we move to our final award winner who has multiple projects, including our Municipal Project of the Year, and that is UCLA. Uh, now the first building we're awarding is the UCLA Levering Terrace. I also lived at Levering during my time at UCLA, but I had nothing to do with this award. Uh, the 60,000, 62,000 square foot UCLA Levering Terrace undergraduate apartment building, which is a 10 story student housing complex achieved lead gold last year with a 41% water reduction and realized energy cost savings of 33% through application of renewable systems such as solar hot water heating, operable windows and electric heat for passive cooling, open corridors and efficient LED lighting. 88% of construction waste over 2,600 tons was diverted from landfill. Nestled into a densely packed neighborhood, the project's terracing returns 57% of the site as an outdoor open space with vegetated roof area and pedestrian oriented hardscape. Congratulations to UCLA Housing and Hospitality Services, UCLA Capital Programs, Studios Architecture, Michael Wall Engineering, Pan Pacific Mechanical, KPFF, Pamela Burton Landscape, Brightworks, EEI Commissioning, and PCL Construction. The next building that we're awarding is the UCLA Denev Bakery and Kitchen Renovation. The Denev Bakery and Kitchen Renovation achieved LEED Gold certification last year and has optimized its kitchen design, reducing water use by over 40% lighting power by more than 50% and selected energy savings appliances with Energy Star rated kitchen equipment used for over 76% of its plug load. Demand control ventilation with local control and thoughtful layout made this an outstanding working bakery to serve the thousands of students residing on the hill at UCLA with healthy lo local, organic and sustainable fare. Congratulations again to UCLA Housing and Hospitality Services, UCLA Capital Programs, RP RBB Architects, Nabi Youssef Associate Structure, M Engineering, N.A. Cohen Electrical Engineering, Lashober and Sovich Food Service, SDA Food Service Consulting, Glumac, Okapi Architecture, 3QC Commissioning, Lees Construction, and Collaborative Project Consulting. Our next project is UCLA Marion Anderson Hall. UCLA Marion Anderson Hall is a truly forward-looking environment for business education. A four stories of learning, administrative, and event spaces where users can experience technologically enhanced and acoustically appropriate spaces that can be adapted to support both current and evolving models of business education. The design creates enhanced visitor access, adaptable classrooms for collaborative and distance learning, and a multi-purpose event space that accommodates over 200 guests. UCLA Marion Anderson Hall achieved LEED Platinum certification last year, and the project has an annual savings of more than 250,000 gallons of water as compared to the baseline project. Over 1,500 tons of debris were diverted from landfill, a 91% diversion rate. Congratulations to the Anderson School of Management, UCLA Capital Programs, PEI Cobb Free, Gensler, Siska Hennessy, ACO, EEI, SOMAS, and PCL. And now, drum roll please, I have needed a drum roll sound for this entire pandemic, and I still don't have it, but our Municipal Project of the Year Award goes to the UCLA Margot Levin Graduate Art Studios, a 48,000 square foot building, LEED Gold certified, located in Culver City's dynamic Hayden Tract, is a studio home to the MFA students in the Department of Art in the School of Arts and Architecture. The studios are dedicated to supporting the emerging artists and strengthening Los Angeles' position as a world arts capital. The restoration was largely funded by a $20 million gift in 2016 from Margo Levin, the largest ever made by an alumna to the arts within the University of California system. The building creates an artist neighborhood with clusters of intimate private studio spaces and communal shared facilities and critique spaces. The design considers the nature of artistic practice today and anticipates change by creating a building that can evolve in the future with new, technology, new technologies and working methods while integrating sustainable materials and strategies throughout. 
the choice to rehabilitate and renovate the existing bowstring or bowstring trust warehouse was at the core of the project. The original building expanded outward to add exceptional ceramics, sculpture, gallery, digital classroom, resident artist, and garden spaces with toplet covered spaces elegantly enclosed by a remarkable perimeter wall of rib tilt up concrete. It strikes a balance at once both grand of purpose and contextually humble. Congratulations to UCLA, the UCLA School of Arts and Architecture, UCLA Capital Programs, Johnston Markley, Simpson Gumpets and Heger, KPFF, Emmy Engineers, Horton Lees Brogdon, Beneclus and Associates, Pamela Burton Landscape, Jensen Hughes, C plus C, MG and Co, Gaia Development, EEI and Abbott Construction. And I will add that part of the reason we chose this project for Project of the Year was really the integration of, of something uh, from the university campus into the, the local community and environment of the Hayden Tract area uh, there in Culver City. So congratulations to all of you for this phenomenal project. And as a reminder, you can check out our eco map to look at all the projects that we've sh shared today. Uh, and uh, hopefully someone on my team will put that in the chat so you can go check that out. And then we're gonna close out strong here with uh, one of our civic awards uh, before we move uh, to the rest, of the, the rest of our schedule. And congratulations again to all of our amazing award winners. It is no small feat to work on these projects, especially to close them out in the midst of a pandemic. And now I'm very pleased uh, to announce our 2021 Policy Leadership Award. Uh, you know, this is an organization that we have a, an immense amount of respect for and is really leading the way here in Southern California. Again, where is my drum roll sound? I need, I need some sort of sound cue here. But the winner is Clean Power Alliance. Uh, we've awarded Clean Power Alliance for a variety of reasons today. Um, the first of which is really their focus on equity as a center in the delivery of clean energy to, to customers all across its territory. Uh, customers for, that were eligible for bill assistance programs were automatically enrolled in 100% uh, green power tier at no additional cost. The Alliance has also continued to work with trade organizations to ensure fair and just workforce development opportunities are considered and made available as a result of its renewable energy procurement. And it also works with local community colleges to support educational programs for those aspiring into industry sectors supported by clean energy. Lastly, throughout the pandemic, it mobilized to offer and extend bill credit programs for both residential and commercial customers that experienced hardships due to COVID-19. Congratulations to the Clean Power Alliance and um, accepting the award on behalf of Clean Power Alliance is Ted Bardaki. Ted, are you here with us? Ted, I saw you here earlier. Ted, I know we sent you a reclaimed wood award just for this moment. I'm gonna give him another moment. Ted? He's in the chat and he's saying that he's muted. So give me two seconds. Let me okay. See. We're just unmuting you, Ted. We'll be right there. Good teamwork. And Ted, I've just asked you to unmute if that helps. Yeah, hi. Um, and can you unmute the video too? I believe so. I'm gonna make you a co-host so that way you can join right, that well, way. Um, while we're, while we're uh, sorting that out, thanks. Um, there we go. Thanks. There you go, uh, Ted. Ben. Yeah, there we go. Thanks, Ben. And, USGBC for uh, uh, this award. I'm personally very uh, gratified by it because um, uh, we have a, uh, I personally have a long history with USGBC, both the LA uh, chapter as well as national uh, participated back in the earliest, uh, the earliest uh, municipal green building conferences uh, back in 2012, 2013. Um, and was uh, chair co-chair of the Lead for Neighborhood Development uh, team way back when in the in the aughts. So uh, really personally very gratifying. Um, CPA, as Ben noticed, we are the largest provider of 100% renewable energy in the country. We have over 300,000 customers on 100% renewable energy rates, including many of your uh, uh, members. Um, we've we've done that always with a real emphasis on equity. And, and so I'm very gratified that you're recognizing that 
um, from the beginning in our organization, we provided um, and we continue to provide 100% renewable energy to low income customers at no additional cost. Um, so uh, regular customers pay a little bit more for that 100% renewable energy, um, but our low income customers do not. Um, during COVID, we uh, gave bill credits to um, struggling customers and low and uh, uh, small businesses um, that totaled over $2 million to 77,000 customers um, without really them having to ask. Uh, we just knew that there was a lot of hardship out there and uh, responded to it. Um, this year, we're extending that because we know that uh, while things are getting better, um, there's still a lot of debt to dig out from underneath, from under, um, across business, across uh, uh, residential customers. We are freezing our rates uh, for low-income customers for another year. So uh, as with many uh, utilities, um, rates will be going up uh, uh, this year, um, but our board has decided to... Uh, not raise them for low income customers. So those will be, uh, I expect to be frozen at our next um, board meeting. And then going forward, um, just to, we uh, continually, you know, we're young, still a young organization, about three and a half years old. Um, and uh, the, we're, but we are rolling out more and more programs. Uh, later this year, we'll be rolling out an EV charger incentive program for publicly available EV chargers, which helps address multifamily, multi, uh, renters, workplace charging. But we are uh, reserving 50% of those funds to locate those publicly available uh, chargers in disadvantaged communities. Um, we have just launched a community solar program uh, and a program called PowerShare, which gives um, an additional 20% discount to low-income customers and provides them with 100% renewable energy. And finally, um, later this year, we will start to uh, um, implement um, uh, a resiliency program called Power Ready, which helps provide clean backup power systems in community facilities that can uh, help us all respond uh, in times of grid stress. So again, I'm, I really appreciate uh, the award. Thank you for recognizing our efforts and we look forward to working with USGBC on these and many other things uh, in the years to come. Thank you, Ted, and thank you for your leadership and partnership. Uh, as, as we've discussed in the past, I think, I think very few people have as difficult a job as you did when, when starting the organization. Uh, and it's great to really see the Clean Power Alliance doing the work that you're doing. So uh, congratulations are, are well-deserved, well-deserved. All right, uh, this concludes our midday awards portion. Uh, we do have some additional awards this afternoon at four o'clock for our elected official of the year, uh, as well as, as uh, our policy leadership award. I'm sorry, our municipal innovation award, which goes to the city of LA and LADDP. Um, our afternoon sessions are gonna start now. So we have a gathering of the green teams part two, uh, which is climate action in corporate America. Uh, we have decarbonization pathways for existing buildings in Los Angeles. Uh, we have black is not the new green yet, but it could be bringing equity to the forefront of sustainable design. And we have zero sum gain, how our net zero accelerator companies are solving for X. You may be wondering what X is. You have to go to the session to, to find out. Uh, and then we have another set of sessions after that at three o'clock uh, on the Horton Plaza reimagined carbon neutral design, uh, sustaining cultural legacies and climate action, how climate planning can be intersectional in topics and identities as well as build back better, how we can innovate our way to a new normal. And then we also have a continuation of our net zero accelerator company session called Zero Sum Gain. Um, I would remind all of you, if you wanna visit our sessions, just click on the lower left-hand side of your screen, check out the agenda You can click to go directly to the sessions. Uh, I would also remind you to please go to our expo hall and visit uh, our exhibitors. Uh, we do have a passport challenge there on the left-hand side of the screen. And we're raffling off a free LEED GA credential. We'll cover the cost for you, as well as a personal air purifier with air quality sensor from one of our net zero accelerator companies called WIND. Uh, thank you for all the great conversation today. I really appreciate the focus on equity and the focus on, on, on health. Uh, that's really what this is all about at the end of the day and the work that we do around sustainability in the built environment. So thank you for joining us and I will see you in some of our afternoon sessions.